I've been making wine for 25 years since I made my first batch in 1995 in March, a uh, four gallon batch of Cabernet Sauvignon made from concentrate and it was pretty good. And that encouraged me to keep doing it. I also planted my first grapevines in 1995 in the next month in April. Uh, I had two Riesling vines and two Deschonac vines, which the Riesling is good wine, the Deschonac, I wouldn't plant again. <laughs> uh, I have no formal viticultural or enological training whatsoever. My total claim to anything is experience. And I am a member of the Maryland Grape Growers Association, which provides a number of workshops and clinics every year, mainly related to grape growing like pruning clinics, but also there are winery people, uh, other home winemakers and whatnot. So I get to exchange thoughts with those people. And also I do a lot of reading and uh, videos and whatnot, anywhere I can find information when I need some information. Um, I ha actually have some books here that uh, I'm going to suggest if you're into winemaking, you look at. Uh, this one by Jeff Cox, uh, From Wine, From Vines to Wines, is uh, the first book I read. This is a 94 edition. Uh, it was first published in 85, I think. And there are newer editions available. And it covers most of the basics for winemaking and also covers uh, grape growing. So it's a, it's a pretty useful book all the way around. Another book I would recommend, and this one I use more frequently now in my wine room, which you can see all around me, is uh, Techniques in Home Winemaking by Daniel Pambianchi. Now this book is almost entirely about making wine, but it contains a lot of information and it's a lot of the information that will answer the questions of how do I do that? Even though I know what it is I need to do, how do I do it? So it answers those kinds of questions. And the third book, I'm not sure I would recommend it, but it is Wine Science uh, by Ronald Jackson. And it is extremely detailed knowledge on both grape growing, grape, uh, grapevine physiology, and virtually every aspect of winemaking, including the legal and uh, other aspects of wine production, basically. <clears throat> uh, winemaking has been going on for a really long time. I think the last, the last new date that I saw extending backward was 8,000 years ago. They found residue in some pots. Uh, and basically the process for winemaking hasn't changed much. You basically ferment some kind of fruit juice, uh, most of the time grapes, and it becomes wine. Now the kicker is that it becomes wine for a while on its way to becoming vinegar. And I'm convinced in my own thinking that the ancient winemakers probably drank more vinegar than they did wine, and certainly more vinegar than they drank good wine, because in those times they depended on wild yeasts and bacteria for their fermentation. Now since then, the, like I said, the process hasn't changed much, but our equipment and our techniques of, of, of modifying that process have come a long ways. Um, <clears throat> I have my notes here, so <laughs> basically winemaking consists of some kind of fruit and grapes are the most common, grape juice, and grape juice for the home winemaker can be either from a concentrate which you reconstitute 
or it can be fresh grape juice, or in some cases, I've been able to get frozen grape juice shipped to me. Uh, I can't do that now, and I don't know why not, but I can't. And also, you can get crushed grapes that are basically the skins, the seeds, and the juice, and you can buy fresh grapes. And all of this stuff comes from literally all over the world now. It comes from Italy, it comes from France, comes from Australia, South America, California, uh, New England. It's, uh, it's amazing what's available out there now. Uh, one of the things I would suggest if you're going to reconstitute grape juice, grape concentrate, is that you not use tap water unless you have a well. And unless you have a well, you don't have chemicals introduced into because chlorine is a, is a, a real no-no. Uh, you can use chlorine bleach to clean your equipment, but after you do that, you have to go to great lengths to make sure there is not one molecule of chlorine left in, in your equipment because it will result in what they call cork twine which is a moldy, not a very pleasant taste. Um, and in, even, even if you use it in your wine making area, it gets, into the, it gets into the wood and everything else. And there are a lot of wineries back in the 80s and 90s that basically had to rebuild their entire infrastructure because they had used chlorine in some areas to clean. The other thing, the follow-up to that, is that sanitation is probably the most important thing you can do in home winemaking, and it's the thing you have to do the most thoroughly. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, a wine kit that you can get from Presque Isle Wine Cellars, which is a, a wine supplier and a winery located in northeast Pennsylvania. It's actually up in northwest Pennsylvania by Lake Erie. <clears throat> I don't don't understand the, na the name, but anyway, that's that's where it is. And that, they're very knowledgeable. They've been doing this since the 70s and they sell juices and grapes and uh, all kinds of supplies. And they have a kit that contains virtually everything you need to make a batch of wine and they'll give you the option of a three gallon, five gallon or six gallon batch. And mainly that depends on the size carboy you get with your kit. And it also includes the yeast and the corks uh, for your first batch of wine. What it doesn't include is the juice and it doesn't include the bottles. And I'll say more about the bottles later. One of, the, <clears throat> one of the things you get with this wine kit is this little booklet, Beginner's Book of Winemaking. And uh, it's pretty useful. Uh, it's very basic. And I've noticed in some of the things that I've bought from them, they will send information in addition to what's on the package of whatever commercial uh, ingredient or whatever they're selling. And often the directions they include are different from what's on the, the container. And I'm guilty of the same thing. Some of the things I'll show you today and the way I do them, you won't find in these books. In fact, you'll find in these books, don't do it this way. But I've been doing it for a long time and I've had mostly success. Occasionally they're right, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they're right all the time, but other thing, my point is that there are lots of ways to vary the process of making wine to suit your equipment, your needs, and to suit you. Two, two of the things you'll get with this wine kit are an oxidizing cleaning agent. This one happens to be called One Step, and I think the one that comes with the kit is Be Bright but they use oxygen to clean your equipment, sanitize your equipment. And the other one you'll get with the kit is potassium metabisulfite, which uh, 
I use predominantly to sanitize my equipment. And when you get your kit, that's the first thing you want to do is take every piece of it and sanitize it, clean it thoroughly and sanitize it. And then you're ready to go. <coughs> uh, the next thing you do is you use your, your plastic fermenting bucket that you will get with your wine kit. And you'll have a lid and a stopper and a, an airlock. Now, the, the, another use for metabisulfite is in your wine. This is where you get sulfites. And I'll talk about that all along the way. But I, I usually put a solution, a water-based solu water solution of metabisulfite in my airlock to keep oxygen from getting in, keep bacteria from getting in, and keep fruit flies from getting into your wine. The next thing you'll do with your fermentation container is introduce your grape juice to it. And I'm going to talk through the process of making wine, either white wine or red wine, made from concentrate or made from juice. Uh, when you, the closer you get to raw grapes, the more involved all the processes get. And you wind up having to crush your grapes and separate the stems. And then you wind up having to press your grapes. And it, it all requires more equipment uh, and more expensive equipment. Uh, a lot of my equipment is homemade and it works, but that's about all I would say. <clears throat> but you'll, you'll also get a hydrometer with your wine kit and a, a graduated plastic cylinder. This one's glass, but the one that comes in the kit is uh, plastic. Now, one of, the, one of the things you wanna do when you use your hydrometer is be very careful putting it in. You, you don't wanna put it in, you don't wanna just drop it in funk because it will break. <laughs> And once you have it in your graduated cylinder, you take some of your wine juice and then reduce it into your cylinder until your hydrometer floats. And then you can read the sugar content in specific uh, gravity or uh, degrees bricks, which is just another measure of sugar content. Um. <coughs> After you've cleaned your equipment and introduced your wine juice and measured your sugar, the next thing you'll do is introduce your yeast packet, which also you get one yeast packet, five gram yeast packet, good for a five or six gallon batch of wine uh, from this Prescott wine kit. And I like to let my juice, because it comes out of my well, and my yeast, all because I keep it in the refrigerator or freezer, I like it to all come to room temperature. So I'll let everything just sit in my wine room for a few hours or even overnight. And then I'll introduce my yeast. And this is one of the departures from the books. I take my yeast and just sprinkle it on the top of the wine juice. And that works. I've only had two stuck fermentations in 25 years. And I, I'm into my 57th lot. And each lot generally consists of multiple batches of uh, fermented wine. So I don't know how many batches of wine I've actually made, but I suspect it's well over 200. Uh, and I've only had the two stuck fermentations. I've also just in passing only had to throw out four batches of wine. <laughs> And one of those was a stuck fermentation that I could not get restarted. It was a raspberry wine back in my early days. And the other three batches were very small batches. A gallon was the biggest. And one of them was a Dishonac. <laughs> I wouldn't do that again. Um, but anyway, so my sprinkling methodology has worked so far. And their methods will work too. I have done that on occasion. And with a stuck fermentation, you have to really go by how they say to restart it. One of the things this Pambianchi book talks about is all the varieties of yeast 
and the effects they have on your wine. And you can affect a lot of what goes on in your wine with the yeast you choose. Uh, one of the things, if you're making wine from, okay, first of all, when you're making white wine, you seldom, if it, uh, only with Chardonnay or maybe a few others, do you want to go up through what they call a malolactic fermentation, which I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that. But when you make a red wine, you almost always want to go through that unless you're using uh, uh, juice that has had things added into it. And usually somewhere on the label of your juice kit, it will say whether or not to allow uh, malolactic fermentation. That's a fermentation that converts malic acid into lactic acid with the malic acid being a very sharp think green apples acid and the lactic acid being much smoother, has a smoother mouthfeel and is more acceptable in wine. Uh, the closer to the grape, to raw grapes you get, uh, the more important that malolactic fermentation is. <clears throat> um, uh, the other thing you may have to do is when you've measured your uh, sugar with your hydrometer is sometimes when you use concentrate and sometimes when you get juice, the juice or the concentrate after you've reconstituted it will be a little bit low in sugar and you just add a certain amount of, and this is covered in the Pambianchi book, a certain amount of sugar to bring your specific gravity up to somewhere around 1.1 is will give you about 13, a little over 13% alcohol. And I like my wines to be around 12 and a half to 13%. Uh, I also introduce, a lot of times, I'll introduce oak chips that uh, sometimes come with your wine kits. And I also add some extra ones on occasion, but I'll introduce them during the fermentation process. And the reason I do that is because then it gives me something in my grape skins when I press them that will allow airspace instead of just one big solid compacted mass of dead yeast cells. Um, and that way I get more juice out of the, the must. Must is uh, another word for grape juice that's fermenting into wine. Um, okay. Now after your your wine has started fermenting, this airlock will bubble profusely initially. And, well, initially it's slow and then it'll get going. The yeast will ex, you know, uh, reproduce and start eating the sugar and it'll start bubbling vigorously and it'll do that for a few days. And eventually it'll start fizzling off. And at that point, somewhere along in there you'll want to remeasure your sugar and see where your uh, see how far along the fermentation process has gone and it'll you to come to a dry wine your specific gravity will get down below 1.000 whatever <clears throat> and it'll actually get down to 0.995 or 992 or 993 somewhere along in there uh, the next thing you'll do is rack your wine off of uh, the sediment that has accumulated in your uh, fermentation vat and you'll rack it into a carboy and you have to be careful when you're racking it to not get the sediment, not to get your uh, racking apparatus too far down that it's in the sediment because then you'll be racking your sediment along with it which defeats the purpose. <clears throat> now with your wine kit you'll get a racking tube which uh, is basically a pump and the way this works is you put it in your uh, wine and you, you pull it up and this fills the big tube with wine. And then when you push it down, you fill a little tube with wine. And you, since the little tube holds less wine, 
you get wine that'll come up and start flowing and you'll attach a, a rubber hose that will come with the wine kit onto this and then pump it. Uh, don't do it without the hose or you'll have wine everywhere. But this thing, I strongly suggest you practice with water uh, until you're really comfortable with using it because it's, it's a little tricky to use it and to keep it out of the sediment and every other thing that's going on because where your wine is going and all that. The other thing to keep in mind with racking your wine is the container you're coming from has to be higher than the container you're going to in order to get a siphon going. Uh, <clears throat> another thing I've learned is uh, that oxygen can be your friend sometimes, especially initially when you first start uh, fermenting your wine. And the first time you rack, you actually want to let your wine splash around a little bit to get some oxygen into it. This uh, helps the yeast and it keeps from producing as much hydrogen sulfide and, and uh, things that you might not want in your final wine. Uh, the hydrogen sulfide initially will go away uh, most of the time when you rack your wine. You, you actually reduce it at that point. <clears throat> the other thing I would recommend is I learned by hard experience that a carboy full of wine or water or any other liquid is extremely fragile, sort of like an eggshell. And if you happen to tap it with another jug or another carboy or anything hard, uh, you can break your carboy. And I remember breaking uh, an almost full carboy, five gallon carboy in a laundry room facility that I was using at that point in Silver Spring. Had a drain in the floor, which I was grateful for at this point. But I remember watching that wine rise up in that wine room and then gradually go down that drain. Five gallons of wine gone. So I learned to use a tub and I put my carboys in this tub when I rack. And then if, if I do break the carboy, which I've done once, I can run it through a coffee filter and salvage the wine without the broken glass. <clears throat> the other thing that you'll discover when you start uh, making wine and transferring it, racking it, is that when you go from one container to another, you actually lose a little wine because there's some captured in the sediment and you also, you, you leave that last little bit because you start sucking up the sediment. So you'll lose a little volume of wine and it helps to have different sized containers that you can put wine into. And even, even if you start with a six gallon batch of wine, you're probably going to wind up with more like five and a half or so gallons. Uh, and I have everything from half bottles, it's called splits, to full bottles, to uh, magnums, which is two bottles to three liter jugs, to gallon jugs, to the, I've got one 2.8 gallon carboy. I've got some three gallon carboys. I've got five gallon carboys. And partially thanks to some of the members of the wine tasting group, I have uh, more five gallon carboys than I used to have. And I also have some five and a half gallon carboys, thanks to John Overstrom and I have one six and a half gallon carboy, no six gallon carboys. And then these big things hold 14 and a half gallons. And they call those demijohns and they're imported from Italy. Now, if you have to buy this stuff, everything up to a gallon, you can, you can imagine where you might get it, you know, from the wines you drink and whatnot. Uh, the carboys and the demijohns are not cheap if you have to buy them. A uh, five gallon carboy the last time I looked was about $50. And these demijohns, uh, they're $70. They're imported from Italy, most of them. And they're also uh, not cheap to ship. So you wind up with about $100 a piece 
with these things. You can also get uh, stainless steel barrels and bulk containers, which are ridiculously expensive, uh, $500 on up. And uh, barrels are the same way. And barrels are really hard to keep clean and they're really only good for a few times and then you have to replace them. Stainless steel tank will last you, I guess, forever, unless you collapse it by not opening the top when you take the wine out. But, uh, okay, enough of that. Uh, the other thing that uh, you'll notice on mine is that uh, I have everything is in us in something that is not hard. This is plastic. This is cardboard. And what this does is keeps my jugs from breaking when I push them up against each other. It's uh, just extra padding. It also, uh, wine can be light sensitive. And I don't think this probably has much of an effect, but it does, uh, it does give me some peace of mind thinking that I've got things covered and protected. Now, one thing I want to show you on this particular jug is cardboard is, can you see the very bottom? There's a layer of sediment. And as you go up, this wine gets more and more clear. And every time you rack, you leave this sediment and your wine gets clearer, more and more clear. So that's another reason to rack. <clears throat> uh, and another thing I would suggest is that as long as you have your wine in these carboys, uh, especially after you rack it from this to this and then from this to another container, then you wanna start keeping tabs on how your wine is evolving. And by that, you have to, you have to resort to tasting it. I'm sorry, but... Uh, that's when you start. And the uh, longer it sits in these containers, if you're doing things right and you, you're lucky, it will taste better and better. Another thing that you will see, uh, when you buy your wine juice kit, you'll get a packet that will contain uh, your yeast, uh, some fining agents and some other uh, chemicals, metabisulfite, uh, sorbate, which you can read about in the book. It's, it's another way to preserve wine and also to sweeten it a little bit without using sugar to sweeten it. Because every time you introduce sugar, you run a risk of reactivating your yeast. <laughs> uh, that's the way they make champagne, by the way, is to add yeast in a, a, a pressure uh, uh, resistant bottle and then letting the carbonation build up in the wine. But <clears throat> it'll talk about fining and filtering wine. I never do either one of those. The reason you do the fining and the filtering is to make your wine clear because wine critics consider cloudy wine or wine with things floating in it uh, to be flawed wine. Now, personally, uh, if it doesn't affect the taste, I don't mind. So. Some of my wine does have a little bit of a, a cloudiness to it, but every time you rack it, it will become clearer. And generally that's clear enough. And if you, if you find it, that's putting in a compound that will uh, either attract particles that are floating in your wine and take them to the bottom, or it literally makes a, a, a protein net of sorts and drags stuff to the bottom. But the, I, it probably doesn't hurt your wine much to fine it, but I don't do it. And then the filtering is where you can really strip out a lot of the things that uh, sometimes make wine as unique as, as it can be. And, and I never filter. And one of the reasons is uh, in addition to uh, stripping things out, the, 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 the equipment you need to filter wine is not cheap, not expensive. And most home wine makers that filter their wine, take it to someone who has filtering equipment 
or there are also places you go wine supply shops and there are a few in the area, not in Calvert County that I'm aware of, but like Baltimore, Annapolis, Frederick, uh, probably DC and <clears throat> probably in Rockville. But there are wines equipment uh, suppliers that have some of this equipment and they'll actually, you can actually not buy a wine kit and go to these uh, specific suppliers that offer these services and you can make your wine there. And basically all you have to do is pay them rent for their equipment and, and they will help you keep tabs. They'll help you, they'll walk you through the process. They'll help you with the process. They'll answer your questions. Uh, it's not a bad way if you're not sure you want to do it and you want to try it. That's not a bad way to start. Uh, I've already mentioned the fact that uh, you can get bottles from the wine you drink. Now there's one little trick about buying bottles and I'll see if I can demonstrate that right quick. Okay, here's two bottles of wine, commercial wine. I didn't make them. <laughs> okay, uh, if you notice at the bottom, there's a, a gap between them. That's because this bottle is tapered. If it's tilted now and now it's straight up and down. And this bottle is not tapered. Uh, I like to keep the tapered, uh, the, the straight walled bottles because they stack better. The tapered bottles, if you stack them, if you have many in a stack, your bottles keep moving up like that and eventually they can <laughs> slide. Uh, and generally, if your corks are facing out, which they are the way I store my wine, then they'll be sliding backwards. But that can also push a bottle out. And you might not notice it till it hits the floor. <laughs> and then you'll notice it. But um, the straight wall bottles stack straighter. And actually, some of them will move out. So you have to kind of keep an eye on things. <clears throat> now, at, at some point, if, if you, while you're racking your wine and you're tasting it, you might uh, start noticing something that's not quite right. Like uh, you'll get a white film starting on your wine or it'll have a taste. It's maybe a little bit like fingernail polish or something. That's a sign that you're getting some kind of an infection, like primarily acetobacter bacteria, which is taking you to the next step in vinegar production prevent that is with the metabisulfite and you can when you start noticing that then you can start introducing some sulfite into your carboys and the way I do that is to mix up a water solution and that's uh, a very nice easy to use solution as mentioned in this Pam Bianchi book. Uh, another thing just just a side event I discovered that syringes are extremely helpful in winemaking and they're available on Amazon or a lot of other places. Uh, I, I don't know any other winemaker that uses them. I'm sure there are some, but uh, I think that's unique to my, my cellar. <laughs> but anyway, when I get ready to bottle my wine, I will almost always add sulfide at that point. And the way I do that is I, I have my wine in my carboy and I'll put it in another carboy down below and I'll have this solution and the amount of solution that I want to put in my wine I'll pour into that carboy while it's empty and then as my wine siphons into the new container it continuously mixes and that gives me a good distribution in a fairly short period of time to uh, distribute that sulfite and the reason I put sulfide in before I bottle is so that I kill any bacteria or yeast or anything else that's in that wine so that when I bottle it, the bottles don't explode and the corks don't push out, uh, just a precaution. And you, you can actually add what sounds like a lot 
of sulfite to wine first before you can really taste it and second before it becomes toxic <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, and as you're i'm sure you're aware some people are sensitive to sulfite uh, but even wine to which no sulfite is added has sulfite in it because it's a naturally produced compound i used to boil my corks and soak them in a sulfite solution. And I have some port that I have, I made in 1998, 1999, that I still have one bottle. And the last several bottles, and even some of my earlier wines that were corked with those corks that I had boiled or uh, sulfited, the sorks get, corks get crumbly. And I cannot get a cork out of my port now without it crumbling. So I usually have to, to run my port through something to like a coffee filter to get the strainer coffee filter to get the cork particles out. <clears throat> uh, now you will get corks enough with your wine kit to do whatever size carboy you purchased. And generally you get about you get about five bottles of wine per gallon of bulk wine. You also, uh, not with the wine kit, but with your wine juice kit, you'll get uh, some labels. Not, not every kit has labels, but some of them will. And you can use those labels. They're perfectly good labels. I early on would make my labels and one of the challenges I had was to use find a glue and to use a glue that would allow me to glue the labels to the bottles for the duration of that particular lot of wine and then soak easily off when I was ready to clean the bottles again and reuse them. Uh, and I finally gave up on that and I don't use the ones in the kits. Uh, what I do <laughs> is I use masking tape and the only thing on the masking tape is the year I made the, the year I harvested the wine and the lot number and I keep a journal for my winery and I keep a separate journal for my vineyard and I keep track of everything I do, when I do it, what, you know, what things I added, what things I, anything I do to my wine, including taste it. I'll write down when I tasted it last. Uh, let's see. Another thing about wine labels on used wine bottles Sometimes they're really hard to get off. Uh, and the only way to get them off is to scrape them off, which is extremely time consuming and not much fun. And I occasionally you'll, you'll buy a bottle of wine, particularly French wine or whatever, that has a, the, the bottle has a, a, a relief on it. And you can feel the relief. You can see it. It's some kind of an insignia. insignia. And I've wondered, what, what wine was that? So I've, I've discovered by accident, largely, that if I leave the labels on, the ones that don't just come off readily, then I can kind of look back and see what wines I was drinking back in the 90s, back in the 2000s. And it's, it's not unpleasant. I usually start drinking my wine after I bottle it, almost immediately after I bottle it. For one thing, you'll wind up with probably not quite a full bottle, sometimes just a drop or, you know, well, sometimes less than half a bottle of wine in the last bottle you bottle out of a carboy or out of a batch of wine. Uh, and that's the one I start with. And then I'll, I'll drink it. And I, I, my goal is to make enough wine that I can drink mostly my wine uh, during the week and my, drink a different uh, 
different year, different vintage, every bottle I open going back from the young wine to the older wine and see how my wine has changed, see how it's evolved. Uh, the other thing I do is I've talked about batches and lots and I mentioned earlier about blending wine and I do blend wine. I This carboy is a Cabernet Sauvignon Concentrate uh, from one brand. This one, which you can barely see, is another brand of Cabernet Sauvignon Concentrate. And this one behind me is my Chambersone from this year's harvest. Uh, this one and my fermentation vat. This is the last I harvested and that was harvested earlier. This is also uh, Chambersone among the last I harvested that this year, because I had enough unripe uh, seriously unripe grapes that I thought I'd make a rosé because I can take advantage of the fact that uh, the riper the grapes get, the lower the acid in them. And with white wines and with rosés, you often want a certain amount of acid in your wine. So that gave me a way to use the underripe grapes without adversely affecting my red wine. I, I almost entirely make red wine. Uh, so I almost always go through a malolactic fermentation, except with the concentrate. The, the other thing you wanna do with blending and also with the yeast you use and the oak, uh, whatnot, some of the, some of the is that you want your wine to end up balanced. And this is one reason why I like my wines to be somewhere between 12 and a half and 13% is that that's the alcohol. If you get too much alcohol and not enough of the acid or not enough of the tannins, which you get from the oak as well as grape skins, uh, then you wind up with a, a wine that tastes hot you can really taste the alcohol and it's it's not as pleasant a wine to drink. What you want is a good balance between the alcohol, the, well, even the sweetness, the acid and the tannins so that your wine tastes balanced. I did leave out a piece of equipment, a couple of pieces of equipment that I'll mention. You get a, a paddle with your wine kit that will allow you to stir your wine and when it's in the primary fermenter you want to stir it periodically especially if you're using uh, grapes or grape skins because what happens with grapes in your primary fermenter is that they'll rise to the top and make a cap across your wine and that cap will dry out and the drier it gets the more likely it is to become infected with uh, bacteria from whatever source and it also when you break that cap up and re-saturate re it with your wine uh, you get more of the flavor components out of the skins more of the tannins and stuff out of the skins and out of the seeds and even the stems that are left over that are desirable in a red wine and chardonnay is kind of uh, Starting from grapes is sort of the same process you go through with red wine, except you don't leave it on the skins as long, but you you do uh, ferment it and, and leave it on what they call a lees, which is a sediment that uh, builds up in your carboys. And you don't wanna leave wine on your primary fermentation lees very long because they pick up lots of things that will make your wines taste off. But in the later carboys, it doesn't hurt to leave them on the leaves a little bit because it makes your wine a little bit smoother. It uh, introduces, I think, complex protein molecules is what I've read. And that's, that's pretty much it for the, oh, funnels. I uh, mentioned funnels. Uh, you'll get a funnel with your uh, wine kit and funnels are useful in putting wine from one container to another without the benefit of a plastic tube. And another piece of equipment you get with your 
wine kit is a is a bottling apparatus. Now this is this is one of my favorite things to use in my winery uh, because you put this end in your the carboy you're going to be bottling from, and this is the end you put in your wine bottles. And to get a siphon started, this has a stopper, and you set the stopper in, and then you just blow on this little tube until you get a flow going. It's 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 beautiful. The other thing you'll get that I don't have on this is you'll get a little tip that fits on here. And when you push that, when you push this down, it'll hit the bottom of your wine bottle and start a flow of wine. And when you let up on it, the flow will stop. If you've uh, made beer, you've, you've used one. Um, but anyway, that's pretty much it for your wine kit. And pretty much it for wine making. I mean, there's a lot of nuances, but go to the book. I'd like to say a little bit about growing grapes. I'm very hesitant when somebody asks me if I grow grapes. I usually respond with, I try to grow grapes, with a big emphasis on that try. I've been growing them since uh, 1995, and I'm just now, I think, getting to the point where I have matched the grape varieties that I hope will produce for me, Chamberson is one that does, uh, with my vineyard site. And there are so many nuances to vineyard site uh, that it's, most of you, if you plant grapes, you'll plant them in some property that you already own. So your site, you don't pick your site, your site is given. So your soil is given, I mean, the whole bit. So you have to match the variety to that site. If you go out and you buy a vineyard, it's already been done. And uh, most of the time, if it hadn't been done on your particular site, you know what the soils are and you know what varieties grow on those soils and on your particular slopes and all this kind of stuff. So that research has been done for you. But in Maryland, there are a lot of places in Maryland, uh, grapes have not been grown previously. And you, you go through this process. Now I've grown, uh, uh, grown the Riesling, the Deshonac, uh, grown Cayuga, uh, Cabernet Franc, Syrah, Sangiovese, Tempranillo, uh, the Chambersong, uh, Baco Noir, which is another French American hybrid like the Deshonac. And I've got one planted now that's Petite Pearl, which is uh, brand new, newly developed as of 2009, I believe, that is an American hybrid. Now, the problem with American hybrids is they're usually high acid and low sugar and low tannins. This Petite Pearl is uh, none of those. It's, it's uh, reasonably well balanced in terms of acid, uh, sugar, and even tannins. And it's fairly disease resistant. It's cold hardy, which I think my site is toward cold end of a vineyard site in Maryland. Uh, Chamberson is my workhorse. It produces a lot of grapes and they'll get almost ripe for me. So that's good. Sometimes they do get ripe. Uh, Baco Noir, I've had problems with it, uh, primarily because it's susceptible to uh, uh, fruit rot. Uh, when I'm, just before I'm ready to harvest, these wines will, these grapes will get fruit rot. And around here, you're going to get fruit rot. <laughs> and there's really nothing you can do about it except try to keep the fruit flies down and the flies down and uh, the fungus down that, that contribute to it. It's primarily, fruit rot is primarily a bacterial thing. And there are very few bactericides that you can use on wine grapes that are successful and not toxic. Uh, and when you grow grapes around here, in addition to 
the fruit rot. There are all kinds of pests that you'll have to deal with. Uh, out here we have deer, which I have managed to, I've got six foot fences around my grapes with one inch chicken wire around the bottom two feet that keeps out the raccoons and possums for the most part. Now it's got a hot wire around the top. So the ones that think you're gonna climb over, they'll hit the hot wire and change their minds most of the time. And I also have to occasionally trap one and get rid of it. The other thing you'll have is uh, birds. And the only thing I've found that works with birds is to net my grapes. And their birds are very entertaining in their creativity uh, toward getting grapes. I have, when I net my grapes now, I start at the top, I net the entire vine all the way down to, to the trunk. And I have to literally on both sides of the trunk, which is just the stem sticking up, I have to clamp those nets together at the very bottom to keep the birds from landing on the trunks and going up through the gap and getting to the grapes. And if there's a hole in your net, the birds will find it for you. Uh, I've even had, had to introduce what I call spreaders, which are uh, PVC plastic uh, pieces of pipe that are joined in a, on an angle that hang over my top wire that spread my net because I've had mockingbirds especially fly up against the net, push the net over against the grapes, and then they'll pick the grapes off. They're very creative. They're, they're, they're entertaining to a point. The only other thing left for you to do is enjoy your wine. And question for you. When you go to blend your wine, what do you use and how do you do that? How do you mix them together? Ooh, that's a good question, Cheryl. Uh, the way I start is I will mix up a, a bottle usually, uh, a thousand liters or something like that, uh, of wine in the proportions that I have it in my winery. Whatever that is, I mix it up. And then I'll pour a glass of that and set it off to the side so that I know what it is and where it is. And then I'll take each batch and I'll have a container of each of those batches and all labels so I don't get them confused. And then I'll start uh, with my syringe. I'll start uh, mixing batches of different proportions. And my goal is to find a batch that I like better than that original, what I call barrel blend. That's what I'm told is a, a blend. If you, if you grow a grape vineyard like they used to in California and Italy and other places, you grow all your varieties in the same vineyard and in the proportions you want for your final wine. And when you harvest, you harvest everything. And that's called a field blend. Oh. But when you harvest those varieties separately and vinify them separately, then when you blend, you call that a barrel blend, if it's proportionally represented. Mm. Hmm. Cool. Okay. And then once you blend it, then you bottle it? Is that... Uh... I'll, I'll, I use a, up till now, I've been able to use a 55 gallon barrel. To, I also use it as a primary fermenter. But when I get that blend uh, determined, which is usually the barrel blend, by the way, almost always the barrel blend, but occasionally not. But I'll dump everything into that uh, barrel that I'm going to blend for that batch. And then I'll uh, siphon it back into these carboys. And then I'll start bottling from that. For me, I don't bottle everything at once. I'll, I've already started bottling last year's wine but I only bottled what I didn't have a container for. Yeah. So I only bottled a little over a case. Uh, and I assume on the, if you're using uh, used bottles that you have to, uh, you have to really cleanse those well. Yes. Yeah. And my experience has been that the sooner you, you wash them, 
after you've finished the bottle of wine originally, the easier time you'll have cleaning them. Huh. Okay. Uh, another point you, you reminded me of, the smaller your container, you get down to a gallon jug, and that's about as small as I've been successful at uh, fermenting. If you get down below that, you, I don't know what the proportion is. I don't think it's exponential, but you, it's close to exponential. You exponentially or near exponentially increase the possibilities of contaminating your wine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I threw a batch away my Bacca Noir this year. I had <laughs> three pounds that I was trying to ferment. <laughs> That'll make one bottle of wine, by the way. Oh. Uh, uh, fruit rot decimated my crop. Well, fruit rot and a raccoon, they decimated uh -huh. my crop this year, Bacca Noir. I have another batch back here that's my Petite Pearl that was almost seven pounds, which is a little over two bottles of wine, and it's it's doing fine. You meant, you mentioned that you don't boil your uh, your corks anymore, but do you cleanse them in some way? I put them in water, tap water, and I don't mind using hot water. That won't hurt them. Yeah. I just put them in water and let them uh, kind of lubricate, which, oh, thanks, Cheryl. Uh, one of the other things you'll get in your wine kit, along with your corks, is a hand corker. My son, older son, gave me a floor corker, which works even better. Uh, you put your bottle on this platform, and the platform will adjust to your bottle size, and then it squeezes your cork in here, and then it's got this plunger that puts it in your bottle. And when it when the plunger goes down, the bottle uh, stand uh, won't go down further. It's a gift I've appreciated often. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, yeah. about how long does it usually take for you to go from starting fermentation to bottling? Okay. Uh, I started harvesting my grapes in September. And when you harvest, the sooner you crush, the better. So I harvested and crushed them. And uh, from that point, I'll go usually a full year and I won't start bottling until usually after the first of the next year. But like I say, I've already started bottling my 2019. Uh, in fact, that's what I tried just a minute ago. Can you use a carboy that's bigger than you need? For instance, if you're making two or three gallons, can you use a carboy of five gallon size? You can, uh, but the more heads, what they call head space you have, the worse, the more likely you are to introduce bacteria and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And how, uh, how do you control the temperature or what do you look for? or What do you use or, or and is it different or are you just, have you just been lucky? How's that work? Uh, the containers I use, and since I make red, if you make white wine, you want to ferment it at a cooler temperature than uh, most people keep their houses, uh, which is a, is a problem. But with my red wine, you want it a little warmer. You want it about 85 degrees. Mm. So uh, even with my 55 gallon barrel, when I'm fermenting wine in that, I find that my wine almost never gets over that 85 degree mark. So it never gets too hot, which is the main thing I'm worried about. Doing it indoors in my wine room, which is uh, central air conditioned. And the main thing with the temperature, uh, especially for storing wine, is it's, it's not good that it gets above about 54 degrees or so. Although I keep my wine cooler at 64 degrees. It's mostly red wine. But uh, it's mostly fluctuations in the temperature that hurt. Thank you All so right. much. Enjoy. Right. Bye. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.